Good afternoon and a warm welcome to University of Central Asia's online public lecture today. My name is Shokat Ali Khan and I am the Chief Information Officer at the University of Central Asia. I am really excited to be the moderator of this very interesting lecture today. Our topic is playing with lives, cyber attacks on healthcare or attacks on people, a research study from the Cyber Peace Institute. We are organizing this online public lecture in collaboration with the Cyber Peace Institute, Geneva, Switzerland. Our today's speaker is Bruno Alapo, Chief Technology Officer, Cyber Peace Institute. Bruno is a seasoned professional with more than 20 years of experience as a managing consultant, leading secure digital transformation projects in various industries spent several years as Chief Information Security Officer for a European Union body, acted as a team lead expert in the fight against cybercrime and terrorism on topics such as critical infrastructure protection, exploitation of emerging technologies of criminal gains, forensic and investigative techniques in cyberspace, and then led development of innovation strategy program for law enforcement. Please welcome Bruno Aleppo. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very delighted to be uh, here today to present uh, to you the, uh, this uh, study we have been conducting since uh, several months at the Cyber Peace Institute. Uh, I will share my screen so that uh, you can see a few slides throughout this discussion. And um, uh, before we start, uh, let me give you a bit of a background. Why we did this study and why we did this report. First, we started around a year ago to develop a program, of, I mean, a project, sorry, which was called the Cyber for Healthcare. And uh, the initial aim of this uh, project was to have a matchmaking initiative between healthcare professional in needs on one side and the cybersecurity professional who could provide help for free for those healthcare professionals who could not afford it, especially during this COVID period where you, we could uh, foresee and uh, see concretely an increase of uh, cyber attack against this uh, sector. Um, as we saw that uh, uh, this project was having quite a big success, we wanted also to know more about what was the problems and the solution which could be recommended for this sector for being published more widely than just to the healthcare professional uh, that we uh, were uh, giving help to. So we uh, transformed this into a program that uh, now we call Cyber for Healthcare program, which is uh, uh, a way to, uh, to collect uh, and consolidate the scattered information together and to understand the impact uh, on people and society as a whole. Uh, because we believe it is very important to really look at the impact, especially on the most vulnerable. Then this report is, uh, you, if you download it, you will be able to see that there are some key uh, findings and some recommendations. Uh, so I will start with the findings and I will explain how we come up to those uh, main findings. Uh, we can see that uh, first, this, uh, sector is, um, uh, is a, a sector which is impacting people, obviously, patients, but uh, you can see that uh, cyber attacks uh, may have a direct impact or a concrete impact directly to the patients, but also to uh, uh, the healthcare services that deliver um, their service to the public. The second level is uh, we see an increase of um, uh, attacks. Uh, why is that? Because usually uh, cyber criminals look at lucrative and relatively risk-free uh, uh, areas uh, to, uh, to attack. And they saw that during this crisis where there, there has been a lot of pressure on the healthcare systems, that it was a sweet spot for them to develop uh, through uh, uh, to develop and to, to get some uh, some uh, some some financial gains. It's also um, uh, it's also near impunity, so it's, uh, you see little uh, prosecution. Uh, and uh, and today we uh, we see that uh, uh, with the key finding number three that 
it really there's no real mechanism, uh, transparent or independent, to track accountability. So to uh, uh, attribute responsibility and to understand who should do improve into the overall system. Uh, we'll come back into details uh, throughout uh, the discussion today. The third, uh, the fourth one, sorry, uh, the healthcare professionals and uh, patients, they do not really uh, benefit fully from the uh, legal instruments that, which are already existing. So if a state uh, and uh, enforcement bodies would be able to improve that, we will see uh, uh, more control or even a decrease of uh, those cyber attacks. Uh, another point we, uh, we saw still in key finding four is we have many uh, uh, initiatives that exist, uh, assistance initiative uh, mainly. Uh, some of them uh, developed by the cybersecurity community to help directly the healthcare sector, but they really like visibility, uh, scale and sustainability. So let's first talk about the context. Why the uh, healthcare is under attack? Uh, it's in fact a concentration of several factors. So the healthcare are usually organizations that are gatekeeper of sensitive information, right? You have uh, health uh, records, uh, you have uh, um, research, uh, medicine uh, research, it can be vaccine research, it can be uh, uh, any type of information that deals directly with patients and uh, how to conduct uh, um, healthcare in, uh, in certain countries. Uh, also, uh, stolen medical records can be traded in the underground markets on the dark net, uh, generally for some fees which can, uh, can be quite generous or can generate generous profit for the attacker. And uh, another factor is uh, intellectual property uh, from medical research, uh, for instance, can be very profitable for the uh, person who gets access to. Uh, one element is also that the healthcare organization are more likely to pay ransom uh, requests since first they, de they deliver services which are quite critical and service disruption can have very direct impact on patient health. And also with uh, uh, whenever you have a sector or a company or an activity which is under pressure, um, meaning like the, the COVID uh, pandemic uh, pressure, uh, the likelihood to pay a ransom to be back operational, to be operational is higher. And uh, what I wanted to mention here is this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, and um, this is the nature of the internet that is a global phenomenon. It's not only touching specific countries or touching, touching specific regions, it's global uh, reach. So usually um, the, the sector is a target of choice, as you can see on the screen for both criminals or state actors, either for financial gains, information acquisition, or for achieving their own geopolitical agenda. So the next slide, yes. So uh, still in the context, um, first on the left side, uh, the pandemic is giving rise to a convergence of malicious and irresponsible behavior. The three main ones we could see is, a, is a, obviously uh, uh, the evolving ransomware attacks that uh, you may all have heard about. So it's quite uh, at the top of the news uh, recently that uh, uh, healthcare facilities are attacked. Uh, but it's also data breaches, uh, stealing company secrets or accessing uh, data records, etc. Uh, and one which is being underestimated is more disinformation operations. Uh, I will come into details uh, of uh, that in uh, in a few minutes on each of them. Uh, also to explain uh, the uh, uh, why the healthcare suffers from a, a number number of vulnerabilities. Sorry. Uh, it is because this, uh, this sector uh, has been uh, um, under undersized at many levels. The first level is more at uh, the digital infrastructure. So they often operate complex, uh, vulnerable, and sometimes outdated infrastructure. So uh, hospitals run multiple types of devices in their own network. Uh, those networks are not necessarily built in a proper way with proper segregations or proper zoning. So they, they, it makes them more vulnerable. 
The uh, auditive infrastructure, uh, whenever uh, you have medical devices, which are quite expensive, they are often delivered with uh, operating, operating system which are running on it. And uh, at some point, those operating system may become uh, outdated and not supported by the vendor. In this case, uh, obviously, any new vulnerability discovered will not be patched because there's no support and there's no update anymore. So um, uh, MRI device can be uh, part of those, uh, like uh, pump injections uh, automated can be also part of this. So this is becoming a growing problem on how can we sustain uh, security and cybersecurity with uh, outdated and legacy systems. A second level is a technical and um, uh, human resources limitation. While there's a minority of big healthcare actors who have deployed strong and good cyber security programs, we could, uh, we could see that the vast majority of, uh, of actors in the sector, they are suffering um, systemic lack of resources. And this systemic lack of resources is to secure infrastructure, to train personnel in cybersecurity, or even to retain uh, or to hire personnel in cybersecurity. Uh, obviously, when uh, you lack this, uh, you have some consequences, and one of them is uh, uh, it prevents proper protection, preparedness, and exercising of your infrastructure uh, to be sure that it's uh, attack proof. And second level is also decreasing your response efficiency, uh, since uh, you are lacking the skills internally that can help mitigate as fast as possible a spread of malware or spread of an attack within your network. Last but not least, uh, many, um, many healthcare uh, hospitals or uh, uh, facilities uh, usually spend um, an overall budget of four to 7% of their uh, IT budget, which is much less than the average of uh, all sectors uh, uh, together, which is around 15%. So there should be also prioritization of budget allocation in a network um, to uh, increase this, uh, this part to be sure that proper equipment is purchased and uh, implemented. So now, who, who are we talking about? Which, uh, which are the victims? So uh, obviously, like in the sectors, we have uh, uh, many facets on that. Uh, obviously, one of those is the society as a whole. So if uh, the volume of cyber attacks becomes too big, it will have a, a strong impact on the society as a whole. Obviously, it impacts real people, individuals and patients, but also it impacts healthcare professionals where uh, uh, they could be facing situation where they cannot deliver their services as usual, or to be back to uh, practices which are more manual or more pen and paper. Uh, but the vast majority of the sector is composed of hospitals, medical facilities, research centers, laboratories, health insurance uh, companies, uh, but also ministries at the government level, civil societies which are providing uh, uh, help or uh, service to the healthcare and pharmaceutical companies. Uh, last but not least, and it's often uh, overlooked, is the supplier and manufacturer. So whenever you uh, have a company or you have a, an hospital to run, you need to rely on a range of uh, supply chains or suppliers, which could be consultant, which could be uh, supplier of software, uh, supplier of uh, device, which have to be supported and uh, be sure that they are all secure at all the time. So if we uh, think about uh, the impact of this, 93% uh, of healthcare uh, sector over the last three years have been suffering some sort of cyber attack or cyber incident, 93% in the past three years. And especially in 2020, we saw an increase of six-fold of attacks on this sector in particular. So let's take some example of a wide variety of attacks that you can see uh, in the report and I can, uh, you can see here in this, uh, in this um, slide. Uh, in, uh, in, let's say, the sector of uh, hospital and medical facilities, uh, in uh, 2020, end of 2020, uh, in the US, universal health service has been hit by a ransomware, uh, meaning that all systems were disconnected and the network were shut down to prevent propagation. 
at around 250 care facilities and hospitals. 250 facilities were disconnected from the network and from the internet. So that is a massive, massive impact on the operation of, uh, of, this, uh, of this company. And obviously to, uh, to, uh, to their patients. Second uh, example I can take here in the medical and biomedical research institutes uh, is the Amos Smith Medicine Research uh, in the UK. Uh, IT systems and email were disrupted for a day, a complete day. And uh, they saw that uh, data were leaked out, medical data and uh, sensitive uh, uh, additional information of 2,300 uh, patients around. In, a, in at the level of governance and health ministries uh, in a Georgia, uh, uh, the health ministry in Luga Center, uh, there have been some indication that uh, some data were leaked out, but also one important element was some data were manipulated or falsified documents within the system. So to, uh, um, to attempt at the reputation or the credibility of uh, the uh, ministry. At the manufacturing level uh, in China, you know, still in 2020, Huawei Medical Company saw a theft and a leak of source code of uh, uh, artificial intelligence assisted COVID-19 detection and experimental data. This is something that uh, uh, is quite worrying because uh, you could imagine that either this code has been used or reused to try to understand how this algorithm works to poison data or to, uh, to, uh, to get this, uh, um, this code to be able to, uh, to have some more intellectual property to resell to someone else. In uh, 2020, still pharmaceutical companies uh, in India, Dr. Reddy's laboratories, they had to temporarily shut down operation in many plants, which were located in the US, in the UK, in Brazil, in India, and Russia, due to a ransomware also. So uh, data leak was also suspected shortly after, and uh, it was about um, COVID-19 COVID, COVID vaccine trials data. One uh, example I can take also in the health insurance uh, part, which is not showing here because it was in 2015, it's uh, Ansem Blue Cross where 80 million patient records were stolen, 80 million. And last but not least, the civil society, I can take an example here on the, on the graph uh, about Northern Light Health Foundation where personal data of nearly 660,000 donors and patients were compromised and, uh, and uh, installed. So you can see that the, the, the problem is uh, quite huge. It's not limited in scope of uh, ge specific geography. And you have different, uh, different type of attack that are uh, running out there. So what are those uh, type of attack? Uh, the, the one which are impacting the most the healthcare sector that we uh, outlined in the, in the report also is uh, first ransomware, uh, which is uh, the most prominent and continuously evolving threat. Second one is a cyber espionage, which is uh, by definition a covert threat. And the last, uh, disinformation and infodemic, which is often underestimating, and I will explain why. Let's go uh, for the first one, ransomware, and a bit of history. Well, somewhere is uh, it's not a new phenomenon as uh, it uh, was first uh, used or first uh, invented in uh, 1989, and it was already targeting the healthcare. It was a scientist at the World Health Organization AIDS conference who distributed around 20,000 floppy disks, so a little disk that you could put on your computer, where you had a Trojan, I mean a malware that would install on your computer and encrypt the files and uh, show a message saying that to get the decryption key, you need to send some money via wire payment in Panama, in an in a, um, anonymous account in Panama. So the phenomenon is not new. It has increased really a lot over the years. Uh, if you look at the evolution profile, initially it was more like having a wide infection and, uh, and, uh, uh, and with a small amount to pay. So uh, you are targeting any individuals you could find uh, with a small amount that uh, not even deserve to, to, um, to, uh, to report to the police. 
so that those uh, criminals were getting um, small amounts, but uh, multiple times. So uh, you see the small amounts uh, ransom on the, uh, on the left side and the uh, opportunities target within, which is like, I don't target specific person. I, however, this model was not working that well. And um, uh, we see over the years that there's a striking number, uh, lowering number of attacks, much less, but now they are more and more targeted. So we have higher ransom demands, but much less attacks, but much more targeted. And uh, in this uh, sophistication and market development, um, certain, certain um, uh, ransomware operator mentioned that they would not target the healthcare sector, but we didn't see it in reality and they were still targeting the healthcare. Maybe it's too profitable. If we can uh, have some numbers also, uh, the value of a data record, if a good uh, medical record can be sold on the dark net at around $300 to $400 per record. And uh, we saw an increase of ransomware uh, between November 2020 and January 2021 of an average of 22%, but 45% in the healthcare sector. So meaning that the targeting is not only targeting a uh, valuable company, but it's valuable company also specifically in the healthcare sector. We see also strike increase as mentioned uh, of the demands. Uh, in 2018, it was around 6,000 uh, uh, ransom uh, per demand uh, that was requested, which was multiplied by around 12 in 2019. And uh, we don't have definite number for 2020, but it's uh, estimated to be around 178,000 to 233,000 uh, dollars for, uh, for ransom. Uh, also, what you have to understand is uh, if it's a small actor or small company, this demand will not be as high. They will be around maybe 6,000, 7,000, because you, they want, those criminals, they want to increase the likelihood of payment. So it has to be sized to the size of the company also. Uh, so the impact it has uh, is uh, around the overall uh, 20 billion uh, of cost to recover from a, a ransomware account. So what does it mean? Uh, the cost goes into stopping an infection, recover from the system for systems, restore data, test system, patching, reviewing access, uh, reviewing network infrastructure. So this is a huge work, which costs a lot of money, much more than the ransom by itself. And it takes an average of around 80 days, 80 days for a company to be able to recover from a ransomware attack at a certain date to be able to be, able to be back on, uh, uh, on the full operations. And uh, it requires obviously skilled personnel that the company may not have, so it will incur even more cost. In terms of um, estimated number of victims that pays, uh, it's just an estimate because it's very difficult to understand uh, who uh, pays or not, because most of the time companies are not willing to disclose this. Uh, second of all is um, we have more and more cyber insurance that pay for this ransom uh, also. And, uh, and it's not advertised or it's not um, uh, tracked as, uh, as a definite number. So this limit is around 25. It has, it has also various payment numbers based on the different countries or region. Uh, so what is very important to know is half of the companies uh, after a survey uh, that was made uh, say that they are not ready to face a ransomware. That's very worrying, and uh, uh, those companies will be inclined to pay the ransom, especially since they don't have backup, obviously. But uh, since the value of the file can be much higher than the ransom, and they will be forced to pay. The advice is obviously not to pay, never to pay, because first, it doesn't guarantee that you will get a key to it for decryption. Second, uh, it will not guarantee that you will not be re victimized or re uh, targeted. And uh, what you have to know is uh, usually cyber criminals, if you pay, put you on a, on a kind of a good customer list where you would be uh, retargeted in the near future uh, or after a few months. 
So how does a ransomware uh, work in, uh, in reality? So the first thing of a ransomware is to find an entry door, right? So you have a criminal that will either use uh, uh, either an email, which is uh, using phishing or spare phishing. So phishing or spare phishing is an email which is crafted for a certain person or for certain audience that will uh, encourage this person to click on certain link in this email. So this is called kind of a social engineering. This is one, uh, one uh, entry point. Another one that you see, RDP on the screen, is uh, exploiting uh, remote services. Uh, usually those remote services is to access system from remotely, and especially now in the COVID, where you have your IT administrator who might be working from home, remote access is, uh, is uh, enabled almost everywhere. The problem is uh, uh, those remote access connections are not sufficiently well secured. So it means that login password can be brute forced or can be, uh, can be figured out. Uh, and uh, and uh, the uh, criminal networks uh, are hunting for that. So they, got, they can get direct access to the heart of the network of the victim. And the third, which is not showing here, uh, is uh, exploiting vulnerabilities in software. So there's no software on the planet which is 100% safe. You may have always vulnerabilities that can be found. And it's a matter of being sure that between the moment a vulnerability is found and the uh, end customer who is using the software has applied the patch, during all this period, the company, the victim is vulnerable. So the goal is to really shorten this as much as possible. So what does it, how does it work? The email received is sent to a, to a, let's say an hospital, then you have a healthcare professional which open the email, click on the email and what happened? The email will then install on the computer and will seek to propagate uh, either laterally or inside your network through open ports or for the, uh, or for the services, through the file systems uh, or try to exploit further uh, uh, vulnerabilities or try to elevate the privilege to get access to more and more and more machines. Once this malware is well installed in your network, it will uh, via botnet inject a ransom, uh, a ransomware, which will do the job of encrypting all the data of all the computers which were able to be um, uh, hit by this uh, by, by this uh, malware. So obviously here you have two options. Either you have an option where you can recover from it, which is the blue part. So it's uh, uh, money obviously, but at least you don't have to pay the ransom or you don't have enough uh, skills, uh, backups or um, ways to recover your data and you will be obliged to pay it. Uh, the idea here is obviously to help those healthcare organization, as I mentioned in the beginning with the cyber for healthcare program to be sure they are ransomware proof and they prepare their infrastructure and their services so that they can be recovered at some point. Not to be stuck in a, in a, in a way that uh, they will have to be uh, paying the ransom. Uh, so obviously things, now a company starts to develop uh, backup systems of their data and they are becoming more uh, savvy on that. Uh, the criminal network groups, they evolved obviously. And now they evolved to what we call a double extortion. So it's gonna be the same mechanism to infect, but instead of encrypting all the computers and all the servers, they will first extract data from the databases, from local computers. And, uh, and this will be extracted and uh, owned by the um, uh, ransomware operator. Uh, it has been developed since 2019, November 2019. And we estimate it is around 50% of the attack today on ransomware. So the, uh, the, um, the double extortion is there to put additional pressure on the victim to pay because on one side you have your system off, but on the other side you are threatened to have your data released in the wild. And this is to, the, to have a goal to increase the likelihood of payment. So how this uh, ecosystem works behind the scene. You have two elements. First is uh, what we call ransomware as a service. 
So it's a model that allows skilled uh, individuals to become affiliate of established uh, RAS packages or services. So on one side, you have the operator, uh, which has developing the, the RAS service. And on the other side, you have uh, uh, skilled individuals who would like to make money. So the work is split in a way that uh, um, the operator uh, give almost for free uh, compared to the reward, the, uh, the ransom market. So they made it available to uh, some people. And those people will be uh, in charge to, uh, um, to find uh, or to, uh, to breach or to carry out attacks on the network to infiltrate the uh, ransomware as a service in there. Uh, so this cooperation, we see that uh, affiliates gets around 70 to 80% of the payout, uh, while the operator keeps 20 to 30% of the payout. 20 to 30 percent mile seems a bit low, but it's uh, unfortunately today the amount of uh, ransomware which uh, are paid, uh, ransom which are paid, are quite high, so they make significant money. Obviously, operator they want to be sure who they associate with, uh, with affiliates. So you have a strong recruitment process, like uh, applying for a company. So you have to pass interviews, you have to show your skills. Uh, you have to answer uh, questionnaires, uh, and then there will be a strict vetting process uh, to, uh, for the operator to be sure that uh, there's no infiltration by police or uh, intelligence service. Then when uh, we talked about uh, the um, uh, double extortion, data are exfiltrated. So what happened to this data? This data is then sold on the darknet. And, uh, and uh, usually, um, I think uh, you have around 20 operators uh, which host their own dump sites, so data are exfiltrated. Uh, and uh, there's a portal where usually you have a web page uh, for the victim to see when the data will be released with a countdown. So it will share your data will be released in that many days, etc. And the comment. this is to instill fear again to uh, make them uh, pay for, for it. Uh, and those leak sites are then used to uh, sell, once the time is out, uh, used to uh, sell those data to other people who can do further attack or further extortion. So it's a never ending story for a victim. Another uh, level of, uh, of uh, threat and technique we, um, we saw and we mentioned uh, is uh, cyber espionage. So the motives are radically different. Uh, so they are not looking at uh, uh, financial gains. What they are looking for is first, uh, obviously, to, uh, um, to steal intellectual property. Second, to uh, uh, gather int uh, intelligence on, uh, on the victim. And uh, last but not least, uh, to be in control of the reputation and to attempt uh, to the reputational uh, position of that uh, person or that group or that hospital or whatever. Um, how does it work? Uh, so usually you have um, a reconnaissance and a preparation phase. So a state actor will not attack a victim without being prepared and without being, having proper reconnaissance. Once this is prepared, and an attack is launched, it has several steps. The first steps would be to infiltrate, obviously to gain ICS like, uh, like criminals, uh, for instance, with a phishing email, a spare phishing email, but exploiting maybe other vulnerabilities or backdoors uh, uh, at, at a level which is more sophisticated than the criminal level. Second is to maintain access. Obviously, uh, a state uh, or a state actor wants to maintain ac uh, access to a system to be able to uh, uh, to um, to, uh, to control this network and to see what is going on over there. Uh, last step is uh, covering tracks. Obviously, uh, if someone is infiltrated into your network. You don't want uh, to be, uh, they don't want to be seen. Uh, they don't want to be detected. So they usually um, implement ways to of cleaning uh, their traces in logs so that the cybersecurity team doesn't see it. And whenever they want to withdraw from a company, uh, they have ways to uh, self-destroy a memory resident malware, for instance. But what is the goal for them? Uh, the goal is first, uh, one of them is to um, compromise sensitive information, which is extracting data, which could be 
intellectual property, as we mentioned, but it can also be strategic planning, marketing plans, financial resourcing plans, uh, and uh, any type of information that is seen valuable. But that's not only the goal, the only goal. The second goal is uh, possibility for a state actor to disturb or to uh, disrupt services. So it's to prevent those to uh, operate or to, um, uh, to be operational so that uh, uh, personnel uh, have an eroded trust uh, in, uh, in, uh, in there. And it can also be uh, changing access rights. Uh, so everything to disrupt operations. So to slow down the operation of a, of a victim. And last but not least, it's also a, a stealth data manipulation. Uh, in the case of Georgia Ministry, Health Ministry, that what happened, there was an infiltration. And in this infiltration, some data were modified and uh, uh, documents were changed, for instance. Uh, and this is the goal to discredit the, uh, the entity uh, in regards to a wider public. Third, and uh, the, the one which is maybe the most underestimated is obviously uh, disinformation and infodemic. So what it is, uh, first of all, infodemic is a contraction of information and pandemic. So infodemic is uh, too much information. It can be the force of misleading information in a digital environment during a uh, disease outbreak. So this is not new for the COVID. It also happened during the... Uh, uh, Ebola in 2014, and uh, the idea is to uh, have two angles, uh, either you do it from an information point of view that enables cyber operation, or from a cyber operation, a cyber operation point of view that enables information. What do I mean by this? Uh, on, in the case of the information enabled cyber operations, um, we uh, see that uh, it's not a new phenomenon, obviously. Uh, and the idea of proliferating force of misleading information is to attend at uh, the trust in the authorities or in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the victims. Uh, some nation exploited the information ambiguity by spread, spreading disinformation on the virus and its origin. Uh, but you have a main thread around this uh, this uh, information enabled cyber operation is it is always built around some piece of truth. So you confuse the mind of people, you confuse uh, the masses on what can be true and what cannot be true. Uh, in order to prevent that or to fight that, the World Health Organization organized a cross-regional statement on the COVID-19 infodemic, and 132 member states signed this to avoid these uh, disinformation campaigns. So some of the techniques are, for instance, uh, trolls and trolls farms. So trolls is, uh, and trolls farms is a group of people who will seek at flooding uh, for instance, social media with fake information or fabricating information and will be spreading it through social media. Uh, it can also be from conspiracists uh, who do not necessarily believe uh, anymore in authorities who are uh, building their own ideas of the truth and that finds some echo in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the internet. And obviously social media relay is a, an important element here because uh, the public uh, is uh, most of the time uh, relaying these messages uh, without necessarily uh, assessing or verifying the source, and that uh, could be a problem, uh, especially in a major uh, uh, in a major crisis. For the second uh, part, uh, uh, operation aim at manipulating data on the victim network. Uh, so we just saw that in the previous slide is the third part where you would uh, use a cyber means to infiltrate a network, to modify data. Uh, so it can be, for instance, let's say, um, uh, let's say you have a company which do research on a vaccine. Uh, you rely uh, your, uh, your research on the set of data. And if this data set is, po is poisoned, obviously your conclusion will be also biased. And this can be quite dangerous for uh, um, obviously uh, patients and uh, victim at the end. All this is, is done to undermine the public trust and opinion against obviously uh, healthcare professionals on one side, but most importantly to associate authorities, can be ministries, government, uh, and it adds a fuel uh, climate of fear and uncertainty. 
So who are those actors? So actors are in two categories. Uh, first category is, is criminal, cyber criminals and organized groups. Uh, cyber criminals can be different form. Uh, you might have heard of crypt kiddies, a hacker, activist. Uh, it could be also dis disgruntled employee who uh, are having access to critical system and uh, on purpose uh, destroy system access or system data, etc. But it can also be organized groups. Uh, here in the uh, healthcare sector, we mainly see operating organized groups, uh, not so much uh, hacktivist, uh, script kiddies, or disgruntled employees, but the most majority is more on organized criminal groups. On the state sponsor side, you have a different type of uh, actors here. You have states with capabilities, meaning states who can develop their own capabilities. They have like maybe in the army or in the intelligence, skilled personnel who can develop code, malware, uh, infection uh, uh, software, uh, and, and to cover all the chain we mentioned previously, like uh, getting and maintaining access, cleaning traces, extracting data, et cetera. Those are quite few. Uh, so some of the states who do not have those capabilities, they resort to uh, uh, an alternative, which is to um, purchase software that can provide them access to system uh, uh, remotely. Uh, so those, uh, those software can be called also access as a service software or cyber uh, espionage uh, software. They are sold against the fee and they, those companies who develop those uh, software, they usually use vulnerability which has not been disclosed or they found themselves that they exploit uh, without the provider of the, the, the software knowing that this, this vulnerability exists. And it exists until uh, someone else finds a, a fix for that. Last but not least, uh, for some states also, is uh, to reach out to, to the criminal uh, underground, especially uh, hacker for hires or groups who are ready, uh, kind of mercenaries, who are ready to uh, help a state uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to act uh, on their behalf. Uh, and they find mutual, usually mutual benefits, uh, cooperation links to some impunity. So a certain state might uh, encourage a criminal group to uh, help them achieve what they want. And in, uh, in exchange, they will uh, uh, prevent any investigation or any prosecution to uh, the, the people from the criminal group. And there will be some conditions uh, like they do not attack anyone in their own country. So who are the top ransomware operators? Uh, today, we, uh, we have around uh, 25 uh, main ransomware operators that uh, are present. Uh, so if we look at the repartition, we have uh, Maze and Egregor. So Egregor is now uh, uh, believed to be behind uh, Maze. So uh, it can be considered as a one. Uh, then it's followed by Conti, Reveal, Double pay, uh, Payment, sorry, Networker, and the rest is uh, accounting for around 80%. And each of these groups, we see they have a different way of uh, infiltrating. They have their own methodology. So if you look at uh, the infection vector for Maze and Egregor, is half of the infection is made through phishing. Whereas uh, for Reville, uh, on the left side at the bottom, phishing uh, is a small part and they prefer remote services. Um, the ransomware operators, they, um, they obviously not um, target only healthcare companies. Uh, they also are very much targeting the education sector because it's uh, seen as also a sector which lacks uh, strong uh, cyber security, uh, but also the retail sector, same problem. And uh, uh, at the top also you see information technology sector. Information technology sector is a bit more harder because they know a bit more how to secure themselves, but the value they can get out of it is much higher than uh, um, any other sector. So that's why they are also at the top of the uh, sector. So what was very important for us is uh, to uh, look at the impact. Uh, often we uh, look um, at impact of cyber attacks throughout the lens of business and economic cost. 
Uh, but at the Institute, and especially in this report, we wanted also to expand on three others, which we see as very important and uh, which we saw was uh, maybe a bit too uh, understudied, uh, which is uh, physical impact on people. Uh, and are we able to have a causality between a cyber attack and the direct health uh, of a person? Uh, the third one is a psychological cost. Uh, how much does it cost uh, in terms of psychology, etc.? And the last one is a societal cost. So if we look at the details, uh, the business and economic cost is, uh, if you look at the data breaches, the healthcare sector is usually having 60% uh, higher, uh, greater than uh, in other sector in terms of cost. But uh, the financial cost in the aftermath uh, of an attack, which is uh, obviously ransomware payment, IT investigation, uh, restore, public relations, can be huge and can be having no limit, depending on the size of your organization and, uh, and uh, uh, the way you want to recover it. So the estimation is around 730 million on those activities. Uh, intellectual property loss is difficult to quantify, but uh, in short, you may lose years of R&D in a split of a second. So you may lose your competitive advantage uh, uh, over um, a competitor, over a, a criminal group that will sell it to your competitor. Uh, one element is uh, business disruption and closure is real, uh, especially if the crisis is not well handled. Uh, nowadays, uh, uh, nobody can say that uh, there will not be a target of cyber attack, but uh, uh, the most important is how you deal with uh, this cyber attack, how well you deal with it. So your stakeholder and your shareholder will uh, judge you on that. Uh, so if uh, we look at numbers today, 60% of companies bankrupt uh, within six months after a cyber attack. So. Uh, it's mainly small companies uh, that uh, that bankrupt, so you can see uh, that it can have a direct impact on the society as a whole, and uh, also on the on the psychological uh, uh, of uh, people who are affected. Uh, last but not least, reputational damages uh, can be irrevocable and even repair. Uh, so managing rep rep reputational damage is really costly, uh, especially in uh, public relations. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, an attack uh, can uh, can uh, I, I guess sorry an attack can live forever in the internet. So nothing is deleted from the internet. So if you have been hit, uh, you have been in the in the press. Uh, this can live forever on the internet. The second level is uh, physical impact on people. Obviously, uh, you have uh, once you have a ransomware uh, that disrupts operation, it has delay in patient care. It can sometimes under your lives. Uh, if uh, you look at the case uh, of um, Dusseldorf, where a patient was redirected to another hospital, uh, where the first one was uh, unable to receive this patient because of a ransomware. And the person unfortunately uh, passed away during the transport to the second one. It means that it can possibly have a direct impact on the life uh, of a person. Um, the medical, uh, also, the medical profession is unable to deliver services in a good condition. So it's what I was mentioning a bit better uh, but, uh, before. Is uh, obviously uh, you as a doctor, as an intern, you have to deliver service, whatever happens. So even if your hospital is not having all the IT services in place, you still need to deliver some services. So you might need to revert to pen and paper, and it can be problematic if you don't have access anymore to uh, medical records. So you may need to, re to postpone surgery to, uh, to delay uh, appointment, and et cetera, et cetera. The psychological cost is not only on the patient, but also on the healthcare professionals. Uh, and uh, it's a fear uh, and sense of lack of control uh, for medical professional. Anxiety in operating system. So uh, as you could see in the ransomware, uh, healthcare professionals are the person who clicks on the link and uh, can spread the, the malware in the whole uh, facility. So this puts additional pressure on those persons 
not to make any mistake on this regard, especially in this time of COVID where those people have been uh, tired, uh, have been doing long shifts, uh, making a mistake can be, uh, can be uh, easy to, to do. Uh, so it's putting a lot of stress on this, uh, on this um, population. Also, when uh, you uh, think about it, when uh, your identity as a patient or as an uh, employee of a company has been uh, leaked out and you have enough information that uh, criminal use to, uh, to steal your identity by uh, creating fake, fake uh, identity card on your name, create uh, credit loans at banks uh, that you don't know about. It creates also a feeling of violation, betrayal, vulnerability, hunger, and powerlessness. And this is a feeling which is very strong and can have, have an impact on an, on an in individual for a very long time. I think, I believe in France, it was estimated to recover from an identity theft. it takes around eight years to be able to fix all this with, uh, with the authorities and the different uh, institutions, et cetera. Last but not least is uh, societal cost is obviously infodemics, uh, uh, cyber espionage on somewhere has a direct impact on the, on the trust within the healthcare sector on one side, but also on the mistrust on the authorities and government. And uh, obviously this, uh, uh, this information operation has still some fear and confusion since you don't really know what is true and what is not true. And some also, uh, which is not mentioned here, impact on the society is uh, combining the business uh, economic uh, costs uh, where companies uh, close the business. It means that really it leads to unemployment. This can have a direct effect on a country if it's uh, heavily uh, targeted. Uh, last uh, part of the of today's uh, discussion uh, is uh, going to be on the legal ecosystem and I will uh, make it uh, quick because I see that we are running out of time. Um, uh, to make perpetrators accountable, uh, there's already a wide panel uh, of law, norms, and treaties that can be leveraged better, but unfortunately, unfortunately today it's not the case. So you have uh, human rights law, you have international law, uh, you have uh, international treaties like uh, the Budapest Convention. Uh, Budapest Convention was created 20 years ago. Uh, it has been ratified so far by 65 nations. And it's a legislation that uh, uh, provides mutual aid between countries and uh, that uh, foster public-private cooperation and strengthen uh, the criminal justice capacity globally. You also obviously have domestic laws, but also a, a number of voluntary and non-binding norms that can be better leveraged to uh, help secure better the uh, sector and to be sure we protect better the uh, end user and the, uh, and the patients. Uh, obviously, this is not desperate uh, status. Uh, it has also some opportunities. So uh, states uh, should uh, ensure that they, they work on rules of law and of course uh, the law in their own jurisdiction and uh, states are encouraged obviously not to violate uh, other states' sovereignty and uh, not to intervene in other countries' uh, affairs. Um, and uh, the idea is also to respond and stop internationally wrongful, wrongful act from own jurisdiction. And uh, we, uh, those countries need to ensure that there's a right to uh, life, health, and uh, can receive information. Uh, medical units, transport, and personnel uh, should be protected all the time. And uh, the, the current instruments which are already existing should be enough to uh, make best use of cross-border cooperation mechanism. Uh, and if all this fails, uh, we uh, they should be sure that they uh, impose punitive measures on actors that, uh, that are not complying uh, with the law. On the healthcare industry, uh, we mentioned that infrastructure are vulnerable, uh, sometimes outdated. So it's a question of being sure to produce and secure secure product, especially uh, uh, security by design. So meaning securing from the moment uh, the idea has emerged of creating a new device, uh, comply with regulatory requirements. So it can be um, uh, regional, local requirements. Uh, what is underestimating also is to inform about vulnerabilities. So there's a need to really share actively within the community uh, incidents so that others are not impacted. So you have uh, 
uh, forum for that, like uh, what we call the uh, CERT, Computer Emergency Response Team. So it's teams uh, in companies who share information, who respond to incident and could share information with others so that uh, they are informed in advance and uh, can uh, prepare. Uh, or ISAC, information sharing uh, communities, uh, where they exchange uh, vulnerabilities and how they serve them. And all this is obviously to protect uh, users, uh, customers, and uh, victims. So to conclude, uh, we uh, have uh, made some recommendations in the report. I would invite you to, uh, to read the report and to read those recommendations. Uh, uh, here we have a list of four of them. Uh, first one is uh, for academia and civil society, where there's a need to really document attacks and analyze human and societal impact more uh, thoroughly. And the Cyber Peace Institute will uh, continue to collect testimonies and, uh, and document those attacks uh, to be able to uh, uh, to, uh, to understand better what is the situation. Second level is address uh, to government, healthcare organization and industry to improve the uh, healthcare preparedness and resilience. So helping all those uh, potential victims to be uh, having a business continuity program, to having a good cybersecurity regime and to help them to grow and to be uh, sustainable and resilient over time. The recommendation number three is address to government, so is to activate technical and legal instruments uh, to uh, protect healthcare. So we just mentioned that we already have some good instruments, but they should be better leveraged. And last is uh, address to government is to all the threat actors to account. So better uh, prosecution uh, and uh, ensure that uh, the rules of law is applied and uh, that. Um, uh, uh, accountability is better uh, uh, implemented over the, uh, the overall uh, sector. This concludes my uh, presentation. I would like to thank you for listening, and uh, I think I will be taking some questions uh, if you have. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Bruno, for a very, very interesting presentation with a lot of uh, figures, relevant figures. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any time for questions. So I think uh, what we can do is that we are going to post this video on our YouTube channel in a couple of days. And I have a couple of questions, but unfortunately uh, uh, we, can, we can ask one question if, if it's okay with you. Yes, I'm fine. Yeah. Uh, what would be your main recommendation to reduce the risks on random attacks? Uh, so- um, uh, Ransom attacks, sorry, ransom attacks. Obviously, um, uh, you have a number of things you can do is uh, obviously uh, is to have a, a good cyber hygiene. So being sure that uh, uh, not only the IT professionals, but cyber security professional knows what they, they do on the on your network and on your environment. But there's some awareness campaign inside the organization to prevent uh, clicking on phishing emails, uh, to detect uh, suspicious behavior on computer or on, uh, on the network. Uh, that's one element. And the uh, second element is to be sure that uh, patching vulnerabilities is done as fast as possible, uh, that the network is, uh, is uh, segregated in different zones, uh, so that if one zone is infected, it doesn't infect the whole uh, network at once, and that uh, there are some regular audits and pen testing to be sure that what you put in place is solid and uh, there's no infiltration in, uh, in your system. Uh, thank you very much, Bruno, and we really look forward to working with the Cyber Peace Institute in future also for collaboration. Uh, and thank you for your time and Cyber Peace Institute for, for this, this session. And thank you. Uh, thank you to all the participants on social media and uh, here we are going to post this video in a couple of days on our social media uh, and our YouTube channel also. So stay tuned uh, for our future online public lectures. Thank you very much and have a very nice afternoon. Thank you.